Well, good morning. My name is Jessica Arbor, A-R-B-O-U-R, and I am an attorney with Horowitz Law in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. With me is my co-counsel, Zach Elsner, E-L-S-N-E-R, and Zach is a local attorney here in Denver. The name of your firm is? Uh, Sawaya Law Firm. Okay. Sawaya Law Firm. We are here today to announce the filing of a new lawsuit against the Episcopal Diocese of Colorado for the sexual abuse and cover-up uh, of our, our client, who has been identified as John H. A. Doe. We believe this is among the first, if not the very first, lawsuit filed against the Episcopal Diocese under a new Colorado law that uh, allows survivors of sexual abuse finally the opportunity to seek justice and uh, hold those responsible for their abuse accountable. According to the complaint, our client was sexually abused by the Reverend Jerry McKenzie, an Episcopal priest of the diocese, beginning in approximately 1995. The abuse lasted for several years, and what we do know about Jer Father Jerry McKenzie is that he was ultimately removed from ministry because we believe he had been accused of abusing other kids. There's not a lot of information out there. The diocese hasn't been very public with any information about uh, Reverend McKenzie, and so we have a lot of questions we expect to be answered during the course of the lawsuit. Our client has filed this lawsuit today and he wanted me to make it very clear to everyone that this isn't just about him, that this is about everyone else that has been hurt by Reverend McKenzie. And the more that he finds out that there are other victims and there were other opportunities to protect not just him, but other children, the more angry he has gotten. And so he is seeking remedy today from the Denver County Court. Any specific questions I can answer? Are there other victims? Are there believed to be other victims? We believe that during the course of discovery, we will identify at least several other victims. There are some who are known to our client personally. Uh, we also know that he is aware of other people who are older than him, who were involved in the church communities longer than him, who have made reference to also being aware of other misconduct by Reverend McKenzie. So we expect once we start digging into the facts of the case that we will, we will be identifying additional victims. Yes, absolutely. Talk a little bit about, you mentioned this is the first time under this type of law that a, an alleged victim can do something like this. I want to commend and thank Colorado lawmakers for joining the national trend of increasing the opportunities that survivors of childhood sexual abuse have to seek justice from civil courts like this. Um, we have seen, you know, increasingly in the last few years, states recognizing that these are the types of issues people can't and don't deal with in an arbitrary timeline that, you know, they have to bring their lawsuit. And so the Colorado lawmakers created a new cause of action that allows survivors of childhood sexual abuse a limited amount of time to seek remedy if they were abused in the context of some type of youth-related organization. And it allows not just action to be taken against the perpetrators, but also the entities responsible for their abuse, like in this case, the Episcopal Diocese. I'm a little confused about the timeline. But is, is there a specific timeline? But it ends in 2024, right? If, did they increase the amount of time that a victim could come forward? Is that what we're talking about here? You wanting me to be a lawyer about this? Well, I mean, if, 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 if you can... I'm a little, it, you're saying this new law does something that didn't exist before. Correct. So when you look at the trends across the country, each state has been met with challenges of how to create these opportunities for survivors of abuse, recognizing that these are issues that people don't deal with until much later in life. The average age to report abuse is 52. So in some states, we have seen revival windows where the law says we are reviving previously expired causes of action. And in Colorado, what the lawmakers had to do in order to avoid some issues with the Colorado Constitution was create a whole new cause of action. And that lengthened the amount of time a victim could come forward? It did two things. It created a the new cause of action, which has, I believe, no statute of limitations from here on out. And it also created an opportunity until the end of 2024 for anyone who met, meets the criteria of the law to file a lawsuit. What types of things did the, did the victim say happened? Can you walk us through, of course, without being too graphic, what did the victim say happened? So we did not get into too many details in the complaint. We do that intentionally. Um, 
the plaintiff here alleges that there was, were several types of sexual misconduct with Reverend McKenzie um, over the close fondling, stimulation, um, sexual gratification. Uh, there was also a a long-standing sort of modus operandi by the perpetrator wherein he would provide the plaintiff and his friends with alcohol and drugs, uh, marijuana, rolling papers, that type of thing, and encourage them to become intoxicated and, and making them more vulnerable to abuse that way as well. How long over a period of time did this happen? The abuse did last for several years, uh, after even after the plaintiff turned 18, and ultimately ended when the plaintiff was able to end contact and break contact with the perpetrator. How long was that? You know, I'm, I don't even remember. I, I think it was about three or four. We, we don't allege it in the complaint, so uh, all we say is there's multiple instances. What made, just to be clear, this is a male victim. Right? Yes. Uh, what made the male victim call over now? <clears throat> Our client has decided to come forward and file this lawsuit today because he has obtained information about other victims and the number of other victims and in the early notice that the diocese and these other defendants had or should have had and the opportunities that were missed to protect not only him but the other people who were abused by Father McKenzie. How did he find out about the other victims? So he learned that information. His family remained active in the church community for a very long time and so he's maintained some of those relationships and as he decided it was time to start disclosing his abuse to people within his support circle people came forward and offered information to him Do you know where Jerry is now? i don't and if you find out could you please let me know i i don't know if he's dead i don't know if he's alive i don't i, I don't have any information he is the most ungoogleable a person on the planet i think right. yeah i've tried to I assure you. Um, I'd be very interested. That's that's a good question for the diocese. I'd be very interested in that information. What is the defendant seeking? Plaintiff? I'm sorry. The, <laughs> what is a plaintiff seeking? So, um, these lawsuits are filed as a symbol and, and, uh, of, of taking back his power, of, of reclaiming and vanquishing the shame that he has felt and the embarrassment that he has felt. And this is ultimately about accountability for him and obtaining a measure of justice that he has waited very, very long for, especially now that he's finding out how many opportunities there were for him to have been protected. How many other victims do, does he believe might exist? I, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that one. During the course of discovery, if this case proceeds as, uh, you know, as the typical case does, we expect that there's going to be quite a few. Do you think what? there'll be more lawsuits that'll come I think it's definitely very likely that there will be additional people who come forward and, and choose to avail themselves of the new law, and I hope that they do. Every, every single lawsuit matters, every single survivor matters, every single step that they can take in their healing process to hold the diocese and those responsible accountable is really important. So if you are yourself a victim, please come forward, report to law enforcement, report to your counselor, find a support system. This is one piece of the journey for you that is now available. Diocese in Colorado has a system set up to alert church members when something like this happens. Are, are they doing anything to prevent others from being victimized? Should there be cause for concern? I would defer to the diocese on what their current policies are. Uh, back then, if the, the, the policy and the procedure and the practice is any indication, there was not. Um, there is also, by the way, as I was preparing this case, there is a Supreme Court of Colorado case called Moses versus Diocese, where the Supreme Court justices go into very um, specific, detailed uh, analysis of facts about cover-ups by Bishop, uh, is it Frey or Fry specifically? And so what we do know is that during the period when this abuse started and continued, that there was an ongoing practice to ignore these types of allegations, to cover them up, to threaten and silence victims, to withhold information from the people who had the ability to protect these children, and to, to basically protect themselves in close ranks. Is this, do you think that the abuse that was taking place here in this particular case, is it more widespread than this? Are there reasons to believe that maybe 
other priests may have done the same thing? Absolutely. I think that, you know, one priest is just the tip of the iceberg. I would defer to the experts who do more of sort of the objective data, but I certainly expect that over the course of the next few years that the window is open, we're going to learn about more Episcopal priests. We will learn about baseball coaches. We will learn about Catholic priests. We will learn about daycare providers, uh, Boy Scout leaders. We will learn about much, you know, just how much our society is permeated by predators. Do you know of any other cases that have been brought against the Episcopal Church of Colorado? Under the new window, no, I am not aware. We believe this is the first one to be filed against the Episcopal Diocese. Whether there were any in the past, I'm not sure. The, the Moses case involved an adult woman, so. What is the thing that is most disturbing to you about this case? Whew. For 20 years, I have advocated for and represented victims of sexual abuse, particularly in the clergy and religious context like this. And every day I get up and I say, today's the day I'm going to put myself out of business because there won't be any more victims and all of the kids in the future will be protected. In this case, I mean, we have abuse in the 90s. We have a man who remained in ministry until the 2000s. It's so recent that it's just indicative of the fact that this is not a problem from generations ago. This is not a problem that's the result of the sexual revolution in the 60s. This is something that is a very real and pervasive threat to children across the country all day, every day. So before he contacted us, the plaintiff actually went to the diocese to report his abuse. And at that point, he was told by the diocese that Mackenzie was the subject of multiple allegations and he was removed and ultimately forced to resign from ministry as a result of that. So we believe in the course of discovery that we are going to learn more facts to confirm that. You guys are, I love these questions. Usually I just have people stare at me, so. <laughs> Any Anything else? Did the, did the victims want you to tell the media anything? Was there, I think I saw a statement. Can you tell us what does he want people to know about this? The plaintiff in this case conveyed to me when I asked him, what's the one thing you want to make sure that reporters take away from this? The plaintiff in this case asked me to make sure that everyone out there, all of you, everyone watching, everyone listening, know that this is about protecting kids. And it's not just about accountability for him, it's about accountability for everyone else who was hurt and should not have been, and about protecting kids and forcing the diocese and these defendants to do better in the future. So that will be the subject of discovery, exactly who owned it. Um, what we do know is that St. Michael and All Angels repeatedly encouraged the teenage boys of the church to go to spiritual retreats at this cabin, and those retreats were run by Reverend McKenzie. Um, I'm not entirely certain who owned it. That will be part of discovery. Um, but what we do know is that regardless of who owned it, it was being used by the church and by the diocese to conduct religious retreats. And McKenzie was, where was he posted? Um, you know, let me check. Give me one second. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure if he was a priest at All Angels or somewhere else. So there is an answer to that, and I want to see how specific I can be with you. Um, he had a diocese assignment in 1995. I don't remember exactly which church it was. Um, but what we do know is that he repeatedly said Mass and celebrated Mass with plaintiff as his altar boy um, at St. Michael and All Angels. He was very close to the, the pastor or the, or the rector at uh, St. Michael and All Angels, and so he was a very frequent visiting um, minister there. But he did have a formal assignment at a different church. So he, he served at Mass there and conducted services, but was not the pastor of that church? Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah.